Rihanna is making music with Chris Brown again. Okay. And my grandmother is still watching over me. Us black women, like samples at a grocery store set out to be picked over and never fully paid for. Us, black women, with vaginas that still smell like unwanted mixed baby's blood and 400 years of forced entry. And this brother asks me if he can hit it. As if it hasn't already been beaten, Outcast goes to corporate Rosa Parks, Ludacris makes a diss record about Oprah, and a room of upstanding black men say, hell, we don't know what happened in that car. Rihanna may have given Chris Brown a reason to beat her. I take it you don't have little sisters, and there must be shrapnel in your back to replace the spine that you once set, that once made you a man. See, I'm not mad at you for your opinion. I'm just hoping we are never two pop stars in a car, and you get mad at me for mine. I can still hear the cries of all the babies I had to get left behind by their own mothers. I got by bet the tongue of Harriet Tubman can still taste the blood of all the wounds she linked to get us here, and we are constantly trying to get back there. And you ask that she don't like her own people because she built a school in Africa. Brother, you must have forgotten your roots. Do you think we only exist here? You couldn't imagine the pain of raising a black panther only to hear your son calling you bitches and hoes on the radio. You are no finishing corpse. Your jaw couldn't walk a Miles Davis inside the mouth of Cicely Tyson, and you question the charity of a black man while this man asks if it hasn't already been... It, while this man asks if he can hit it as if it already hasn't been beaten. We have been running this world since the beginning, have yet to receive a day off our feet. There are no holidays dedicated to us, just a bunch of poems to undress everything but our minds. Millions of songs made to feel, make us feel like we were born to be called everything but our names. And cemeteries dressed up like music videos, burying our images every other TV station. We get one Michelle every 44 years. We get one African-American teen pregnancy every 44 minutes. And Lil Wayne says he wants to bleep every girl in the world. Sarah Good and Vince Binge, Trey Song says he thinks he invented sex. How disconnected, yet still hanging from the umbilical cord we clipped you from. Stop asking, can you hit it? Take your, mother's for, take your mother flowers for no reason. Stop making excuses for putting your hands on us. Stop putting your hands on her. Stop running out on us. I'll stop running over her. Stop treating us like samples at a grocery store. Do not touch us if you have no plans on making this home. Monday morning, 7.50 a.m. Worn sneaker soles hit flash bush pavement cause time tossed too much to be fly this morning. I'm late, again, as usual. And you would think it was too early, but the smell of weeds with smoke was heavy in the air. The block boys are out already. Dark silhouettes sit behind fogged up car windows. They are surgeons cutting dutches, urchus, eyes searching wildly to find the leaves vein they cut. They have the hands of pianists. Fingers moving nimbly, crushing bud-like dreams they thought they were told that were too big for them, so they pulled. But with every blunt, they prove naysayers wrong because they are artists. Their tongues painting backwards, wet with saliva, rolling L's too late to be passed in the cipher. They are musicians. From thin air, they create clouds of dark smoke billowing up from blackened lips. My lungs cannot take it, but they are grown men, so they inhale deeply. I remember thinking, maybe if I lace their blunts with paper shreds of poetry, they get high enough to reach redemption, and then maybe they'd be closer to God. But with cement under their heels and dirty money in their pockets, they were the lords of my block. And for them, that was godly enough. James finds himself at the back of the classroom. His baseball cap casts a shadow on his pimple-stained forehead. A wide shirt hangs from his broad shoulders but no one ever noticed him. Melissa, the teacher asks, and she says nothing because she is not here and Melissa has never been here because Melissa is just some abstract jumble of syllables that doesn't fit her position. She is not what she seems. She doesn't want to have to explain to her mother for the 23rd time why she doesn't want to wear a dress to prom, doesn't paint for her face because her whole body is painted on. Melissa, Melissa, James doesn't want to explain where he came from. Because with the exception of Melissa, he has been deemed an abstract reality by everyone. All he wishes for is to get to wear a tuxedo to prom. And Melissa's been tucking at breasts that will be growing in for three years now. Being 
had been, been using duct tape to press them down and mold them in more into pecs. She just wishes that people would understand that at birth her genitals didn't know which way to grow. Mad at God who would, couldn't relay a message directly to her hormones that they should produce more testosterone. The only person who understands her is James. And they have been playmates since the age of four, around the time that girls notice boys and boys notice girls. See, James' family wanted daughters instead of sons, and Melissa's was always like that male beetle that everybody called a ladybug. Melissa, 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 where is she? Sometimes she wish she could rip the skin from her back every moment of every day. She feels trapped in the flesh of the stranger, Melissa, as she stands to her feet wanting to say, I'm here, and I have been here since I was born. So quit asking me if I'm a him or a her, because when you combine the two, you, you the, to, when, cause when you combine the two pronouns, you get H-I-R, here, and God combined these two genders and put me in this one body transgender. So quit acting, to, so quit acting and quit talking about me like I'm not here. James falls back into Melissa's skin, into Melissa's skin, and the two comfort each other in the syncopated heartbeats, waiting for the day wherein Melissa can finally scrub off this made-up genetic makeup when the teacher asks for James and he can say, "I'm here." Thank you. Sheldon Alexander is a diverse, daring, and blunt spoken word artist. Um, he's located here in Amherst, Massachusetts, addressing and poetically encouraging social activism through a variety of themes. Please give it up for Sheldon Alexander. Come on, round of applause, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be sharing with you three poems of mine. Hmm, this one is called Visionaries. I had a dream of men holding the iron before the acme anvil. Hold your breath. See the country at a standstill. Yet I stand still on the land ripped from the natives, built on the backs track back to the slave ships. More than Africans enslaved on those same ships. Soon. More than cotton we would pick in the house, books and pens we would grip until we tasted freedom. The appetizer of the revolution for Euro and Afro-Americans as we stare and grin only as countrymen trying to reach new heights like Tuskegee Airmen. But in the field being related from the lashes to segregation of the lavish, we realized we weren't meant to walk on the same pavement. But by George, we could have made it. But we are too busy building almanacs, typewriters, street sweepers, traffic lights. ACs and refrigerators for your peanut butter, stoves, mops, lawn mowers, cell phones, mailboxes, and motors. I could go on like pacemakers that keep your heart going as we build a, as we build a history for our generation. Like our ancestors in the motherland for their generations, rising to a prouder people, it seems mischievous hands plan and plant guns and drugs, politics and policies, hidden war cloaked in peace, love and democracy. The outlandish hypocrisy, sneers and jeers of white faces painted black, trying to betray how black would act, but my God, how shameful it was years later it became fact. Excuse me. Ignorant to the European ways and when stripped of our culture, we learn to imitate the masters and reclaim our humanity. Then the dashiki rocking Afro picks and fists. Eventually that new Jack smooth cat era held our noses high and low. An angel of black wings and skin of powdered snow. As my eyes flutter through the pages of my mind, overdosing on knowledge and history that was never mine, I realized for almost five generations, we are the product of street parenting due to drug addiction, that savage affliction, destroy families and values along with the, mis with the media misvalues, giving the present presence of what you see today. And that's when MLK awoke from his grave, and he would say, I had a dream that one day we would wake up from this nightmare, visionaries. All right, all right. To all the women in the world, and it was inspired by my girlfriend and God. Um, I don't have a title for it, but I keep telling everybody it's Proverbs of a woman, so I'm just gonna run with that one. <laughs> like lightning and thunder penetrating the sky, catching eyes or catching lies, you are more than what appears. Much more than stars contributing the constellations feeding the galaxies, for you are more than a woman. 
just listening to your heartbeat. It creates an indescribable description, something of a natural depiction like a Van Gogh Picasso capturing the Renaissance art space of a heart shape. To put it in the simplest of terms, her blood pumps into the next generation, making heroes and villains. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teachings of kindness are on her tongue, Proverbs 31, 26. Yet the wisest woman builds a house and the ones lacking in sense with her bare hands tears it down, Proverbs 14, 1. See, you are more than a woman. You are the other half of men. That's why men are told to hold steadfast to their wives and become one. So for the quantity of a woman's character is more precious than jewels and gold. And for when I see you, I see the very blades of grass that give the Amazon its glory. A woman's teachings are more deep rooted than legends and stories. For you are more than just a woman. You are my mother, my girlfriend, my doctor, my exes that show me what I really want in life, my friends, my family, my brother's keeper, the hearts, the what the wives that make my brother's hearts rejoice, queens of Africa and England, empresses of the East, providers of the feast since hunters and gatherers knew how to eat, the ones who flock the sheep and sow the fleece. You give reason for nation to rise against nation in your name, Helen of Troy, Cleopatra of Egypt, Bathsheba of Israel, Guinevere of England, and even the Sabines of Italy. Women, you make men pigs, dogs, and wolves but you also make us priests play things in sheep. Okay. So the next time someone degrades you, tries to sexually enslave you, remember your mind is of equal or greater potential and your beauty is of the most desired qualities and possessions and your spirit, your spirit cannot be measured by any quantity or bound. For you are more than a woman. Thank you. All the people from my hometown, Springfield, Massachusetts, the murders that, that go on, um, honestly, it's nothing compared to Chicago, but it's still his home. This one's called Who's Next? Who's next? I will not digress the palms that blow holes and souls lifting the spirit out the chest. Everywhere I turn is great history. A city that named Bangfield, 413. From rifle to gun street to magazine park used to be on me. Don't go outside in the dark. Who's next? A game of lost lives shot. Who's next? A game of lost lives. Two stars, Super Mario. Rest in peace. Who's next? The biggest shooting range only I can see. Open nine to three around Mickey D's. And if you don't know, a straight could hit you in the toe. Who's next? Birthday bash for the joyful 18 year old. A Puerto Rican who spoke with so much soul. Certain exchange words to three who weren't invited. Mad enough to strap up, go to the party and drive by it. Who's next? Shotgun blast, rock the whole house. But it's sometimes just what I need to put me to sleep now. Who's next? Me, you, my brother and his crew. Brothers, baby, mothers, who's next? A friend scared when a gun faced at him. On some stairs, bullets was past him. Cousins are hurt. Well, at least he's not buried in the dirt. Who's next? Who's next? Who is next? I will not stop talking. Let the bullets fly and sparking every night, no, every day. Who's next? Old ladies at church. Who's next? Store clerks rush to a hospital because I hold up for work. Even if you tell me who's next, still don't stop the hearse. Who's next? Thank you. That's a that's not a very good thing. Okay? But it has it has happened. And it still happens in some places on earth today, unfortunately. Where people's personal rights, their right to go where they want to go, their right to marry who they want to marry, their right to immigrate, their right to uh, earn earn a earn a living wage, earn money. Those rights were taken away from people who were enslaved. You did not have those rights. In fact, you were claimed as property of someone else who asserted that they had personal rights. You were their property. And so that order that you heard Camilla, Camilla Ray read at the beginning of the program today, Black History Month Unplugged program, Unplugged and Ongoing, it said in that general order that we must have equality of personal rights with property rights. 
so people in their person cannot be owned as the property of another person. But it took a war, it took the Civil War, of which people bravely fought right here from this area. In that war, and it all came to a final point in Texas, in Galveston, Texas, when General Granger read out that order that forevermore those who are enslaved are free. Their children are free, all the way down to the present generation. They're free. But a lot of people had to fight to make that happen. And part of the fight wasn't just with guns, it was with words. It was with ideas. It was with telling the story of what of what the, what the enslaved person felt. And one of the great storytellers of that well, like running is who our next presenter, our next person, is going to bring us to think about. So I ask you to turn your attention, your minds, and your heart to your soulful yes. storyteller. Can you say that? When I say soulful, you say storyteller. Soulful. Freedom 
ought to be for everyone. And Juneteenth is about making it possible for people who were held in captivity and called slaves to know that they had been emancipated. They did not know that emancipation had happened. But it was voices that came from people like these young people that would not rest until everybody knew that emancipation was theirs to have. These are our children. This is the next generation. This is why we can be hopeful and have these celebrations such as Juneteenth. Give them a big hand. This morning that I was to do storytelling, I was annoyed. Just so you know, don't do that. Because these are important times. Yes, storytelling is entertaining, but it is given to us from people who wanted us to know their truths. This is about our truths. And so I'm going to tell a story because there are so many people who just sort of stopped in, don't know where you are. This is where you are. You are now in the village of the undefeated. You are now in the village of the undefeated. You are now in the village of the undefeated. You are now in the village of the undefeated. You are in a village that has come time and time again under war. Yes. And it has won and lost some battles, but it has never, ever claimed defeat. You are in the village of the undefeated. You are in the village not of the descendants of slaves, but the descendants of captives that were brought, stolen from Africa, distributed into the Caribbean. You are in that village of descendants. You are in the village of warriors. We do not mess around. This is story, but this is story that passes our own truth. This is how we do it. Everybody ought to know what freedom is. And if you want to think that, yes, what a nice thing to be gathered here on the council. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But right here in this village of the undefeated, there is reason to worry about the fraction and about the way we fractionalize. Let's not ever think that there is an ideal place in this whole spectrum of the village of the undefeated. We deal with our own jealousies. We deal with all of that. So this story is probably based on when the French were in and around Algeria. This story was probably inspired by that, but I've taken it and adapted it, so now it becomes our story in the story, uh, in the village of the undefeated. There was once a village, and that village was under the siege of their worst enemies. Their enemies were encamped all around the village. They had been fighting with that enemy for some time, and in that process, their crops had been burned. You have heard of food deserts in America. And in that process, they had been cut off from clean water. And in that process, their warriors had been wounded. You have heard of crack houses in America. You have heard of the public school system being shut down in America. No accident there. You have heard of this. In that village, they have started talking among themselves about giving up, surrendering, and thinking maybe if they just would surrender their enemies, 
might be merciful to them. Herman King thought that. Yeah. And so, they talked among themselves about their wounds. They talked among themselves about the nature of their enemies. Well, while they were talking, the children had and, and the children sat over quietly listening to the adults and, and they heard the adults talk about starving for water and they saw that they were wounded. But the children, one by one, got up and they started to walk away from the village. And they walked for a while until they reached a place that was all wooded. They called it the sacred grove. The children went and they lined themselves along that wooded area in a single line looking into the wooded area. They were too young to be admitted into that area. They knew that and so they just stood. And while standing there, quietly, not one word was spoken. While standing there quietly, the children began to hear the bush crackle underfoot. And they began to see a light rising from above the trees, from inside until it lit above, and they knew that the ones they hoped for were coming. In time, they saw the first one of them, women. Their hair, a crown of white on their heads, their brown skins glistening, their eyes full of light. They were dressed in white gossip. And one by one, the children parted, and one by one, they walked right in that space they had opened up for them. And they started walking toward the village. Not one word was spoken. Not one word. And when they all were out of that wooded area, the children lined up behind them and went on home with them. All of them were women. And they got there to the village and they saw how wounded the villagers were. They saw that they had not had water for a long time. They could smell the smoke of destruction. The drums were silent. There was not a sound of joy. After they listened to everything that the wounded ones had said, the leader said, bring me water. Well, the villagers looked at them and said, well, don't we, we, they, we got cut off from the river. There's no water. Did you hear us? We were sorry. If we had water, we would not have known. She said, bring me water. And she pointed, and some of the children came to her, the ones she pointed to, and she said, bring me water. The children went right away and found the calabashes and all of the containers they could find, and they left to get water. The villagers, the elders, were sitting, puzzled and frustrated. They felt that these women had been too long in that sacred grove. They had lost touch. They couldn't possibly be connected to reality. Another one said, bring me grain. Didn't we just tell you that our crops were burned? There is no grain. There is no grain. But that one pointed at the children, and the children came forth. And she said, bring me grain. And they went and found containers and left. Another one came forward and she said, bring me two calves. Our herds have been run away. We told you that. 
bring me two calves. And the children said not one word. They went in the direction of the hoarders, that one percent. Another one came. And she moved so gracefully around. She said, why are the drums silent? Our own funeral dirge? What do we want us to do? Sound the drums. And why is the cooking fire delaying, unlit, like the cooking fire? By this time, some of those who were wounded had decided there's no arguing with them. So they started the fight. And somebody went to the drums. And the drums stop. And here's how they sound. Now you are the drums. Boom, boom, ba. Boom, ba, boom, ba. Boom, boom, ba. Boom, ba, boom, ba. Boom, boom, ba. Boom, ba, boom, ba. Ba, 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 ba. Boom, boom, ba. Boom, ba, boom, ba. Boom, boom, ba. Boom, ba, boom, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Full of food, 
and she said, there's something wrong here. About that time, the sounds of the dancers started to rise in the air. And they were dancing and the drums were sounding and it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. She said, we don't have to leave this place. We don't have to come again. But these are not people who are going to surrender. And so, that army left. When the people inside realized what had happened, they turned to thank the women of the sacred grove. They turned to thank the women that prayed all day and all night for them. They turned to, to the women to thank them, those who knew their story. And they looked and they had already started back to the sacred grove. They had done their job. And that was what was needed. Well, they say that that village came under fire more times than one. Their, their children were sometimes confused about how to love one another, and they sometimes would hurt one another. But the villagers would never give up on them. They never gave up on their children. And the children, as they grew, told the story of the day that the women of the sacred grove came to them. And as they became parents, they passed the story along. And so it is today that the children who have learned the story of those who were stolen and brought here and held in captivity, those children have come to understand that they are not the descendants of slavery. They are the descendants of those who were kidnapped and made captive. They, are, they have come to understand that they came from civilization to uncivilization. They have come to understand that they now are the standard bearers of the story. And they are telling their children the story. And their children will tell the story. And so it is that everybody is learning more and more what freedom is. Oh, yeah. Everybody ought to know It is a blessing to be a storyteller. It is a blessing to tell this story to you. Jenna and April are twin sisters in the second grade at Fort River. They have made it their business to help everybody participate, especially kids with special needs. They are kind and friendly to all students and unfazed by challenges and obstacles. The selfless acts have made a true difference in the lives of other students. We'd like to thank Jenna and April for making the Amherst community a more pleasant place to live. Please give them a round of applause. The next person that's receiving the award is Ben Thiessen. Over the last few... Over the last year, Ben has become a more active member in our community. He has worked to prevent anti-gay bullying by questioning politicians and participating in workshops. Through this, he has made our community a better place. Please give him a round of applause. The next person receiving the award is Wesley Kill O'Hill. Wesley has shown compassion, exceptional compassion for his peers and teachers. Wesley, time and time again, has helped kids with special needs and people who are new to the school feel welcome. Wesley takes the time to truly get to know students and his classmates. Wesley is a true friend to many kids. Let's give him a round of applause. Zach Kreitzer Land has been a great person at the middle school. Over the last two years, he has worked tirelessly to foster a community that values diversity and mutual respect. 
He, is, he has been a member of the school's LGBTQ club. In seventh grade, he worked on a poster com campaign to eliminate the use of the phrase, that's so gay. In eighth grade, he helped promote the National Day of Silence at the middle school, a nationally recognized day, day that represents the silence that many people with certain gender identities or sexual orientation experience. Thank you, Zach, for all you have done. The next person receiving the award is Dottie Guerrero. Do Dottie is a supportive to people who need it. He has a friend with physical limitations. Dottie has supported his friend, and that support allows this student to participate in everything. The next student receiving an award is James Kerwin, a recent alumni of Amherst Regional High School. Over the past four years, James was the president of his class and a spokesman for the entire school. James was a spectacular student athlete for Amherst Regional and created a welcoming environment in the classroom and on the tennis court. Thank you, James, for your generous efforts in improving our community. Regina East, another recent graduate of Amherst High School, has been a dedicated member of our school community and the broader global community. As a freshman, Regina volunteered to take part in the peer tutoring program, but she didn't stop there. She continued to do this while conducting studies about West Africa, eventually participating in an exchange to the Gambia and Senegal, and working with the Trust Agency for Rural Development. The Human Rights Commission is extremely thankful for all that Regina has done. Shepherded the Human Rights Commission since 1999. For 13 plus years, Reynolds has been the voice and the face of the commission. He has championed cause, mission, fight, and whatever you want to call it, with full force and vigor of a dy dynamic personality. Reynolds has tackled many an issue and held out both arms in a welcoming embrace for all those, all those that chose to accompany him on his journey. Here's a small sampling of the topics that Reynolds has woven into the community dialogue throughout his membership on the Human Rights Commission. The future of the Survival Center, the devastation in Darfur, Martin Luther King Jr. celebration, bullying in schools, subsidized fees for LSSE programs, WFCR multicultural programming, Human Rights Day celebrations, and many more. Reynolds has also volunteered to serve on search communities, committees for important towns and school recruitments. He has used his camera to, to provide a pictorial image of the town and regional events. This past December, he decided to re retire from the Human Rights Commission to follow new energy and passion. Thank you, Reynolds, for all that you've done for the town. You'll be missed. We've had an opportunity to recognize elders of the community who have done the old person work and now I'm here at the other end of the receiving line strangely enough which is which is great which I appreciate that I am also pleased to know on the program that as long as we as a commission and you should know that Amherst by mandate is to have a human rights commission. This is kind of rare in Massachusetts, and you should know that. And for that reason, I am applauding the present commission, which now has reached full strength, nine members. But at the same time, I encourage all of you to consider assisting the commission from outside the voting rank, which means that you have expertise that the commission can use. You have certain talents that I think you would like to share on a pro bono basis, of course. So I applaud the commission and I applaud the residents of Amherst, since I'm now a resident of Chicopee, having escaped Amherst happily, and also nice to return to see friends 
of the past and congratulating new persons that will come bringing issues before the commission that affect the town, the region, and in some cases, the country. You are a vital community resource. Thank you very much. particular event or the celebration perhaps some of you are feeling very proud yes feeling good okay all right someone step forward we're feeling good feeling good one two three go all right more feelings about what's going on yes excited someone step forward with excited okay these actors are going to act out the feelings for you yes sad Sad. Andrew's going to play sad. Mad because it shouldn't have happened. Proud. 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 And mad. Right here. I was listening to him. Proud. And mad. Somebody doing mad. I know, but I'm talking to this little boy first. So, somebody come forward and do mad. Angry at what? Nobody should ever enslave anyone else. So let's have somebody come forward and do that. Okay? And over here. Crazy. Feeling crazy. Okay, Hunter's got that one. All right, and we need one more for Annika. Another feeling? Another feeling from someone? Yeah. Feeling love struck. Okay. Spread out, please. I'm going to be the um, emotional orchestra conductor here. We do lots of fun improv to, to warm up as a group. our enforcer right here. He makes sure everything stays in, in, in the lineup. But this is Trevor Baptiste, and give it up for Trevor. Welcome again, everybody. Is everybody having a good Juneteenth? Great Juneteenth. So listen, um, um, I'm here to just address everybody, and I guess uh, uh, talk about the vision that we had for today that has come to fruition. You know, our brother Shabazz, brother Ed and I sat down one day and they're talking about our beautiful children and describing how they would grow up here in Amherst, said we really need to enforce and foster the community intergenerationally being active. We didn't want our children to grow up feeling isolated. We didn't want our children to grow up feeling as if the only people they had was me and Uncle Ed and Uncle Shabazz. We wanted them to feel like there was a whole community that watches over them. So in doing so, we decided that Juneteenth is an important holiday that we could use as a reason to celebrate and get youth from elementary, from junior high school, from high school, from college, adults in the community, and elders in the community all together in one celebration to disseminate information about what's going on, to celebrate each other, and in general, have a good time. <laughs> so it's in that spirit that, you know, 
I count myself amongst the blessed to be able to have a vision and be able to have good friends and good spirit around me to see it brought to fruition. And from this point, what we hope, what we pray, what we expect is that the people who have been around each other today, the people who have broken bread and eaten together, the people who have danced together and shared their passions and their spirits, will now recognize the community that you all are a part of. How did sister say it? This is the community of the undefeated. The undefeated. In the spirit of Juneteenth, as has been um, um, talked about, Juneteenth is a holiday down south that's celebrated because it's when people learned of something that had already happened. You've been emancipated. It was news to people. What? Really? In that same spirit, there are things, that's the way information works, there are things like that that are still happening today. <clears throat> There is information that our community still is slow to figure out or get. The quicker you get information, the quicker you can respond to it and as a community, be active. So some of the big things that are happening around here in this community, there's big issues going on surrounding housing in Amherst. There are big issues going on surrounding education and the uh, potential regionalizing of our K through uh, uh, six elementary schools. These are things that you don't want to find out after it's happened or, or uh, uh, you don't want to happen to you. These are things that an event like this is designed to spread it throughout the generations, that and everything else. So, um, thank you for being part of the community. Thank you for coming together. Thank you for disseminating information. Uh, we have somebody uh, uh, at the tables at Yak sending out information about regionalization and somebody sitting there to describe information that's going on with housing in, Atlanta, in uh, uh, Amherst. Uh, besides having a very good time, which we hope everybody did, we also want everybody to be empowered to be active in this community of the undefeated. With that, it looks like our, um, our, 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 our entertainment is just about ready. My youngest son, Ade Lomo, <laughs> who might want to might wanna sit with you guys. <laughs> And uh, uh, we'll introduce the next act. Is the uh, MC here to do it? We're going to just do it right now because we are ready for a live performance by Rebirth. Put your hands together for Rebirth, taking you to a new level. Give thanks, Rebirth.
Of a new dawn.